Well, hello everybody and welcome back to season three of the Sharing Jesus Confidently podcast, where we talk about all things sharing our faith with others. Today I have with me a special guest, Pastor James Ayton. He and his wife, Kate, lead in a phenomenal church, Favour Church in Manila, and they also have a location in Brisbane. And God is doing amazing things in and through their life and ministry and through their family. So today we're going to talk about all things sharing Jesus confidently, his story, and a number of questions that will help you unpack how easy evangelism is. Great. Awesome. Why don't you welcome with me Pastor James. Pastor James, so great to have you with us. Sweet. Lovely to be here. Thank you so much, man. We, um, we love you. We're so excited to have you here this week and uh, just you. for the privilege even of this conversation. Yeah. Um, but uh, to kick it off nice and light, tell me, what is your favorite food? Uh, unhealthy. Unhealthy? Uh, yeah. I love burgers and fries. <laughs> I'm, I'm a, I'm a uh, burger. Awesome. I drink uh, healthy. I yep. generally just have water. Okay. So that I can eat more unhealthy. Right. So yeah. the theory, it's almost like one of those theories like have diet drink and it, it, it No, no, no. I drink water. Just, like just the diet water. drink is still unhealthy. That's still killing you. <laughs> but water, I'll drink water so I can have more burgers. That's right. my, yeah. There you go. I'm a burgers theory. and fries guy. Right there. We'll remember that to take you out to dinner. Mm. I, um, so another question, favorite football team? I know the answer to this one, but others won't. I'm a, a card carrying member of the SNM football club. Yep, so well, we don't hold that against you. I love Essendon, <laughs> but for those, but but then I'm also I love the Melbourne Storm for rugby yes. because I'm not one can't, dimensional because right. there's different people watching this. Yeah. But I also love Manchester United as wow. a football club wow. as well, and the Dallas Cowboys. Yes, those are my four football clubs. Come on, yeah, Dallas so Cowboys. Who, whoever's watching this from whatever country, all really? things to all people, right? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but I do love Essendon. I love I'm a big Essendon fan. Yeah. Okay. Melbourne football. There we have it. Yep. All right. Favorite worship song? Oh, I don't know. Uh, gee, you got me on that one. <laughs> no, I, lo I love all worship. I'm a worshiper. Uh huh. I think I love. I always go back to. I, I either always go back to uh, "Oh Lord, You're Beautiful" by Keith Green, uh -huh. or "I Exalt Thee." Whenever yeah. I get on the piano, Come I kind of always end up in those two songs Ooh. and singing them. So. Take yeah, but I, but I do. I just love worship. Yeah, in general. Come on. Yeah. All right. Favorite author or preacher? Old school. Uh, you hate me for saying this. I don't love reading. Uh, okay. I love the Bible. Uh huh. I'm a terrible reader. Okay. They say this thing, you know, leaders are readers. Uh -huh. I hate that. I I think leaders <laughs> it's are learners. Yeah, it's discriminating <laughs> against us that struggle. Leaders leaders are learners. Uh, yeah. yeah but maybe. Oh man, I don't know. I love. Yeah, uh, like, I don't know. I, I, I love T.D. Jakes. Yeah. Yep. Old school when I was younger, I loved the guy called Chris Hill. Yeah. Uh, yes. Who was a phenomenal preacher uh -huh. who actually preached a couple of messages that really radically shifted my perspective on life. And, Come on. But yeah, I love African-American preachers. Yep. Okay. All Good right. Time. There but you yeah. go. Very good. All right. Um, and I guess today, just to kick it off and start off with, yeah. maybe just tell us a little bit about your story and about how you came to faith in Jesus. Yeah, so uh, I was born in the Philippines to an Aussie father and a New Zealand mother, and they were missionaries in the Philippines for 13 years, and so I lived there till I was 10. And then I went back, uh, we came to Australia and lived here in, in Melbourne where we're filming this for about seven years. Yeah, wow. And I always grew up knowing Jesus, n knowing he was real, seeing miracles, demon-possessed people writhing on the floor, all that kind of stuff, Damn. particularly in the Philippines. And so I, ne I never ever questioned the validity of the existence of Jesus. Yep. But when I became a teenager, I, I, on I was, I'm a pretty simple guy in general. Mm -hmm. I liked women and I liked alcohol. Yeah, right. And I had this sense of I'll do the Jesus stuff when I'm older because I yeah. know it's real, uh -huh. but I'll do the Jesus stuff when I'm older. And so I was halfway through my grade 12 uh, here at a school called Waverly Christian College. Oh, well, well. And my parents uh, came to me and said, how would you feel about wanting to go back to, to the Philippines to do your last year of school at a missionary? That's why I had this accent. Yeah. I got an American it's accent because I went to an American uh, missionary school there. And so I was excited. I didn't really like my parents at the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking a year away from them, uh, back in the country that I, I still feel is my home. Yeah. And so I went back to the Philippines, went nuts for three months, enjoyed it. And then uh, in November of 2001, I was playing basketball. And one of our best friends 
uh, essentially had a heart attack, dies on the basketball court in front of us, right? Wow. And me and all my best friends, about 20 of us. And that night, I, I remember they rushed him off. He had died in front of us, but then they still took him in an ambulance and, and took him off. So we had to wait in the school uh, for about two hours. And they wow. came and told us finally that he had died. And I remember I, 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 we were all crying and you know, just trying to process. I'm 17 yeah. years old. Like, how do you process this? So I went behind our school gym, which overlooks the entire city of Manila. It's, it's this beautiful place where I've been. Uh, my kids go to this school now, wow. which is crazy. So I always love to go sit in this exact same spot. I know the spot. And I'm sitting there and I'm crying, trying to process it. And in my head, I remember just talking to God. Because remember, God's real. Mm. I, just, I just didn't yeah. like the rules, the yeah. rules. I just yeah. didn't like it. And I'm like, if I had died tonight, where would I have gone? And I just, and I remember blurting out physically hell. Wow. And I just started to weep. And it was this moment of maybe I don't have time mm. in the future. You know, like the whole fire and brimstone. If you walk out of the church building tonight, get hit by a truck. You do you going? know where you're going, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. people are like, no, don't say that. But man, that was me. Yeah. Like in that moment. And so that was November. In January at our school, we had a preacher come. And he, he shared his testimony, which was basically very similar to mine of, yeah. of just the vices of life, not really caring about Jesus. He was a missionary kid as well. And I remember putting up my hand and, and going, wow. I need to take this seriously. And, I, and my desire was there. Uh, I'm a huge believer in the sanctification process. Yeah. I think any pastor has to be a believer if you love people yeah. in the sanctification process of, you know, uh, sometimes people have these radical transformations, but mm -hmm. the majority of people, you know, process. it's a process yeah. of becoming more like Jesus every day, which I'm still on. Twenty, yeah. What am I, 21 years later, I'm still on this process. Wow. And so I put my hand up, and I wasn't perfect straight away, but it started a process that then six months later when I graduated high school, came back to Australia, my parents took over a church, and I decided in that moment I really had to take things seriously. So I Made a few yeah. mistakes in that first six months. And so I cut out the, the two main things that were coming before me and Jesus. Wow. And I put them aside. And that's when my relationship with God began to grow. And my involvement in church and, and my relationship mm -hmm. with Jesus and my involvement in church have run a parallel journey for the last 21 years. Wow. And I, I love that. Yeah. I, I, my, I love the local church. And I love that how I've grown in Jesus as a person. I've grown as a servant of Jesus as well in his yeah. church. Come on, so, that's yeah, so that's my quick story. Isn't that beautiful, the, um, the fear of the Lord when it gets you? Yeah, <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, and it's amazing for a lot of, I think a lot of kids that grow up in church. I've got a real heart for kids that grow up in church yeah. because it's almost like we become numb mm. to how great God is yep. because we're surrounded by the goodness. Yep. You know, you it's it's like you don't know you're living in blessing until you get removed from the blessing and realize what yeah. you had, right? And so I think a lot of times a lot of Christian kids growing up not having this fear, this reverence fear of the Lord yeah. because we've just grown up around it as it's normal. It's not a oh, yeah. God, Abba Father, right? Yeah. I think every Christian kids needs to have their this that God revelation moment of oh, you are Abba Father, not just oh yeah, what's up God? Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm yep. saying? Like, and yep. I think a lot of Christian kids we've grown up uh, uh, for for those that have grown up within the church have grown up with this uh, familiarity with God that's yep. not healthy. Yeah. Yep. You know, there because yeah. familiarity breeds contempt. contempt. Yep. Yeah, that's it. And so you lose that respect. So I love the Lord's Prayer. I, yeah. I preach on this all the time. Our Father in heart, art in heaven, hallowed be your name. So Jesus starts it off. The, 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 the foundation of the Lord's Prayer is intimacy. Yeah. Our Father. It's this term, Abba, which is this, which is this affectionate term that grown adults would use with their father, right? Yeah. So he starts it off with this intimacy. Oh, you are my Father. And then what's the very next next line? Hallowed be your name. Your name is holy. Like, you are my father, but whoa, chill. <laughs> You're still holy. Yep. You know, so it's not like, hey, dad. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, father, I love intimacy. I, I sit on dad's lap and give him a hug. Yeah. But just chill. He's still he's sitting still up in heaven up. and he's, he's still, still holy. Hey, he's, yeah. he's the creator. Yeah. And and I just love that in, in the first two lines, we, we see this beautiful invitation of God to be intimate, but yeah. to remember that he is holy and we should have a fear and reverence yeah, yeah. of who he is. Yeah, <clears throat> it's interesting. I think there's, um, there's a real heart in that space for kids who, who grow up in those, 
environments yep. they don't know the Lord personally. Yes. They know of him, but they don't I think know it's, him. I think it's almost harder. Yeah. Because I see people come in and they find Jesus in their, their late teens or their 20s. Because mm. that's obviously the, the largest amount of, uh, the biggest time in people's lives, right? Yeah. Teenagers, late 20s, but they Jesus, can find Jesus anywhere. And it's like you see their aha moment. Uh-huh. Aha. It's like I was in darkness, now I'm in light. light. Yep. I think as Christian kids, like, we live in the lit room, but yep. maybe with darkness in us. Yeah, yeah. But we're in the lit room. And so it's, I think it's almost harder sometimes to, to mm-hmm. have the aha moment yeah. as a Christian kid. But it's not impossible. Yeah. And, hey, if I can have it, yeah. any, anybody it. can have That's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I really feel like God's got um, a heart for that next generation. You know, I was reading through Joshua chapter three and four, yep. crossover, consecrate yourselves, going to do great and mighty yeah. things. They cross over and Joshua commands them to set up the stones memorial. You know, I love it. Remember the stones. Just remember. Yeah. And yet two generations later, they grew up not knowing totally. the Lord or it, his ways. One of the saddest word. stories in the whole Bible. It, ridiculously yeah. sad. It's because the parents didn't live it out and they didn't speak of. Exactly. Yeah. So they had a word of faith, they had a walk of faith, but they yep. didn't have a witness of faith. What, what's interesting is, and I know we're talking about evangelism, and we won't spend time on this today, but you probably need to do another series on how should parents evangelize to, to their, their children, children. Yep. particularly in church. And so my wife, we've got a uh, basically a nine, a seven, a five-year-old yep. right now, right? And so we're talking a lot about, they grow up in church, they love church, yep. which I'm so grateful for. Yeah, yeah. They love the house of God. There's not a fire in their bellies yet for the Holy Spirit. Yeah. But we've actually been talking about, I don't want to force feed God to them. Mm-hmm. I want to leave breadcrumbs for them to find Jesus. Yeah. I want to be an example. My wife and I are an example. We have worship in our house. We'll pray together. Yeah. We read the Bible. But, you know, I feel like some parents just force feed yeah. Christianity and God to their it's like, how should we evangelize to people? Should we force feed it? Yep. Should we be an example? Should we be bread crumbs? So for us, we've kind of gone, okay, and we're not perfect, and we don't know if this is yeah, going to work, yeah. but we kind of want to lead breadcrumbs where it's like, hey, this is what we believe, but yep. you need to work this out yourself. Yeah, yeah. Even from a young age, Come you on. need to see if you believe this. Yeah. And we're going to, and I think we'll talk about this later on, but we're going to live a life that looks attraction, attractive yeah. Yeah. to be followers of Jesus. Yeah. And, and I pray that my kids follow the bread comes to Come Christ. On. Because if you force feed it, once they become adults, it yeah. doesn't matter how, if anything, force feeding, it pushes them away. potentially away. Yep. But how do you do it? I don't know the answers. Maybe yeah, we can yeah. do this in 14 years with my, <laughs> with my kids. When you've, when yeah. you've excelled at it and I'm starting I, at it. <laughs> people, that, people that write parenting books and oh, your, kids, your kids aren't in their 40s, you're idiots. Like, you need to give them <laughs> you gotta time. Wait, you got something yeah, to say. Yeah, you got to yeah. give them time 100%. to make sure you get it right. 100%. Anyway. Well, obviously, speaking about that, you're obviously in ministry. You and Kate doing a phenomenal job there in the middle of Brisbane um, and leading people. Mm. How do you keep that evangelism? Obviously, in the family, your own yep. kids, that's, that's, that's part of your journey. But how yeah. do you keep evangelism at the forefront of your mind, sharing the gospel with people in the context of a busy life in ministry? Yeah. I, I think it's harder sometimes mm. because your world gets surrounded by uh, Christians. Yeah. So I, I think it's hard. I, I get to evangelize to people every week when I preach. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, the lie is that that's evangelism, uh-huh. I think. <laughs> yep. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's tough. So you've got to look at your life and go, okay, where, where am I evangelizing? Yeah. How am I spending, you know, how am I sharing Christ with, with people around? Yeah. And I think, uh, so for me, the, the way I look at evangelism is it's it's not just sharing Christ with somebody. Mm. It's everything, right? It's it's your being a reflection of Christ to mm. somebody. And so I can evangelize to you, even if I don't lead you through the sinner's prayer. Yeah. You encountering me can evangelize to you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I love Paul. Some people plant the seeds, some people water it, yeah. right? And yeah. some people see it grow, get the fruits of it. And so... I think that everything I do is evangelism in that I may not lead you to Christ. Mm. I may not even speak to you explicitly of the doctrine of salvation. But if you know I'm a Christian and I treat you well, I've just left a good taste in your mouth. That maybe somebody else along in in your journey 
and you can they can begin to and you go oh you know I had an encounter with this weird Aussie Filipino American dude <laughs> and he said he was a Christian and and I guess as well we're working against the negative attitudes towards right. Christian Christians are hypocrites you bigots yeah. uh, all that kind of stuff yep. and so I think if I can leave a good taste of Christianity in someone's mouth yeah. then it's going to help in their journey of mm -hmm. finding Jesus and so I think for me you know, it's just looking at opportunities. Uh, we have a park where we live. Yeah. So just, you know, I, I, I'm not the guy that's like, hi, I'm James. Do you know Jesus? Yeah. You know, I'm just not that guy. Yeah. Um, some people yeah. are. I'm not. Uh, uh, but but it, inevitably, because of my position, yeah. it always comes up that I'm a pastor. Yeah. And I would ra I actually try and not tell people that. That's yeah. sort of the last <laughs> thing. Because yep. I want them to see, because as soon as you, you say you're a pastor, then it's almost like you're expected to be good. Yeah. I want them to experience me as a Christian, not as a pastor. Because yep. I should be good because I'm a Christian. Christian. I should yeah. be loving and kind because I'm a Christian, not yeah. because I'm a pastor. Yeah. Uh, and so I just try and use that in wherever I go uh, to, to share the love of Christ. Uh, and, and if I can get that opportunity to then, you know, I, I remember sitting on an airplane uh, and, and again, I, when I get on an airplane, you know, like some people, I hear these preachers like, you know, every airplane ride is an opportunity to lead someone to Christ. I'm like, man, airplane ride for me is put my headphones in and just watch a movie, right? So I yep. remember getting on the airplane uh, maybe a couple years ago, and this, this Aussie guy from the Philippines coming over to Australia, we're traveling back. And so he starts talking to me, and I'm like, oh, oh okay, here we go. <laughs> I just wanted yep. to watch a movie. And so we start talking, and, and I'm... And he's like, oh, so what do you do? I'm like, oh, yeah, I live here. You know, we work. Oh, so what do you do as a work? So I always try and leave it to the, I'm like, oh, I'm actually a pastor. Oh, and then he kind of, you know, shifted. Yeah, he kind of yeah. pulled away a little bit. And then I said, oh, so what are you, what are you doing here in the Philippines? He goes, oh, I, I you know, I, I own some, you know, some bars and stuff here. I went, oh, uh, where are those bars located? <laughs> right? <laughs> it's amazing. And he goes, ah, oh, and he said, he said this place. Uh, he goes, oh, uh, Alangapo and Angola City. I went, oh, those type of bars, because Alangapo and Angola City are the two biggest strip club sex, yeah, wow, uh, sex places in the Philippines, right? They're <laughs> yeah. they're from the old American bases. Uh -huh. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yep, no, th those type of bars. But you know, we're really good. And he goes on <laughs> to explain about how. He treats all his hookers and strippers really well and, and all this kind of stuff, right? And, and, and again, how do, you, how do I then respond? Yeah. Like, man, you're a sinner going to hell. Mm. I acted interested yep. in the fact that he gets all the hookers tested every week. And I'm like, oh, that's nice of you. And so there's a little bit of tongue in cheek, but we began to talk. Anyway, it turns out, grew up in church. Wow. Mother is still in church. Wow. You know, he, he feels a little bit guilty about doing this job, uh -huh. but it's earning him money. He's getting about 45 grand a month wow. just by owning these things. And he, and he got a, his family's got a huge business in Australia. And this is a side project getting him 45 grand a month. And so we began to talk. And I, in that moment, I'm like, you don't need any judgment from me. Yeah. And so I just began to share the love of Jesus. I didn't lead him to Christ in that moment, yeah. but I, but as well, and, I, and I've got a theory as well about the prodigals. Mm -hmm. The prodigals know the way home. Yep. You can't force a prodigal home. Mm -hmm. The father never ran after the prodigal. Yep. He let him go because the prodigal then knew when he hit rock bottom, he knew how to get back. And his father was waiting there with loving arms. So this guy on the plane, mm -hmm. I, was, I just tried to share how God had changed my life. And I tried to love him. Yep. We exchanged Facebook uh, think you know what I mean and, yeah. and tried to I wanted to leave a good taste in his mouth of what a Christian was Beautiful. and so that maybe there's somebody else maybe his mother who's still in church yeah he actually I encountered this guy and he was different to what I thought Christians were you yeah, know what yeah, I'm saying yeah. so Salt and light. yep we have Salt to be and light. a yeah. taste and an exposure to the light yeah absolutely and I think a lot of Christians leave such a bad taste in people's mouth yeah. Yeah. that we need to I mean I don't know if you're gonna ask this but let's talk about it I think, I think one of the greatest things that we need to do, people, people reduce evangelism to, I got to tell you about Jesus, mm -hmm. right? And then you can swing. So there's, the, there's like the two extremes is people, people go, I, I just have to tell everyone, you're going to hell, you need Jesus, right? And then the other, the other swing is Bill Hybels rock, you know, relational yeah. evangelism, uh -huh. right? Walk Take time. Yeah, walk across the room, yeah, remember yeah. that? Take time, build a relationship, right? 
And so you end up being friends with someone for 10 years before you even mention Jesus. Yeah, so, that's a problem. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, but I, I think for me, it, you, what you say, so the people that you got to do this, it has to be backed up mm. in your life. And so I think we have to make living a life of following Jesus look attractive yeah. and not fake. Come on. Not a fake thing. How you doing? I'm blessed, too blessed to be depressed today, yeah. right? It's not that at all. <laughs> it's, it's a, you know, like for my kids, why would they follow Jesus if my wife and I are always fighting, yeah. if we're always depressed, if there's no joy in the home, mm -hmm. if I'm yelling at my kids all the time, yeah. if they see what I preach and then see me live something different, different. Mm -hmm. that's not living an attractional life yeah. of following Jesus. And so I think making Jesus look attractive, now we don't have to make Jesus look attractive. He is he attractive is. enough. Yeah. But but we, we have to actually show people that following Jesus brings joy. Yeah. It brings peace. It doesn't bring perfection yeah. Yeah. at all. You're yeah. still going to go through stuff. You're still going to have storms. You're still going to have your, your low valleys. You're yeah. going to walk through your shadow of death. You're going to go through all that. But when you do it with Jesus, it's as much. So then when you actually get to the point of, hey, you need Jesus, people are going to be like, yeah, it, it, he seems to have helped you in your life. Yeah. Yeah. How can you, you know, these people are like, you need Jesus and go, mm, if, if Jesus. It looks like that. If, if Jesus <laughs> looks like your marriage. Yeah. If Jesus looks like uh -huh. your finances. Uh -huh. And I'm not prosperity, but I'm just saying, like, if, yeah. if you're constantly in debt, yeah. constantly, can't, you know, constantly using your money terribly and not stewarding it well, if you're, if you're a terrible parent, if you're just angry, if, you're, mm. if that's Jesus, I don't want it. Yeah. So you get what I'm saying. So, yeah, so evangelism yeah. is yeah. not just knowing your, the doctrine of salvation. It's actually then backing it up the with your life. life. And, what, and what did Jesus say? You will be known. Your right. fruit, right. how you'll be known as a disciple is what is if you love one people, yep. right? You love one another. And so if you're, if you're loving one another, then you cannot love people if your life is a mess. Yeah. Right? It's got to come out of the overflow of who you are as a person. Yeah. Genuine love, not fake. Yeah. Not fake love. And so I think evangelism is as much about showing it. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not the, I'm not the you know, I'll take 10 years to show it. No, no. You, yeah, need, yeah, to, yeah. you need to get yeah. it a bit There's sooner. Balance. But you have to back up what you're saying yeah. with a life that actually looks like Jesus has changed your life. Um, with that, I want to encourage you, if you have not done the Sharing Jesus Confidently course, check it out. It'll teach you the five simple gospel points, the truths on how to deliver that, and it will set you up for the win in your conversations with your friends, family, and anyone that you find in your sphere of influence. So thank you so much for being a part of today. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Sharing Jesus Confidently podcast.